Well, praise the Lord. I'll tell you what, if I were a part of this congregation, I'd be encouraged. I really would. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. The righteousness is literally what the text says. In other words, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after God, for they shall be filled. How many of you remember ever hearing that old preacher, Vance Havner? He used to have this statement. He used to say, it's on when old brother Cup gets full to overflowing that sister Saucer gets in on it. <laughs> Amen. I want you to think about further the next verse. That's Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 6. Now this is not the text. I always get down to the end of a meeting and I can tell you very honestly I have three messages to preach tonight. Now the Lord's going to sort one of them out here in a minute but I've got three. But I was thinking about this as you all were testifying. If you look at the seventh verse and Matthew chapter 5, you would read the following. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. If there was ever a missions text, that's it. That's it. If you look at that beginning in 5.3 and begin to trace it down through... And you get to the place indeed in your life where you're hungering and thirsting after God. And you all know that thirsting is a hundred times more intense than hungering. So it's a growing mass uh, issue. And every time that you and I are challenged to face some sin in our lives, the result of that is always the same. There is a hunger that develops and it develops and it develops until it gets to the place where there is a thirst. You want God. Now the seventh verse fits in this way. Everything up to this point has had an inward look and an upward look and now there's an outward look. What he describes here is an individual that has vision. I want to tell you congregation tonight I'm going to speak very candidly to you. You ought to thank God tonight that you have a preacher that has a heart for God and a heart, therefore, for missions. This, friend, is a turning point, now listen to me, in this congregation. There have been, yes, discouragements in the past, but brethren, that circle is coming around. And it's no accident that you have the man that God sent here. And it's no accident that the heart is outward toward missions. Blessed are the merciful. That is the altruistic spirit or the other spirit, the outward focus. You see, folks with an inward focus are dying ones. And the only thing that makes it an outward focus is when the Spirit of God is allowed to have His way. And when that occurs, you begin to raise your horizons. You begin to get vision for what God can do. He says it in another way in, uh, in the Old Testament. I love this passage of Scripture in Isaiah chapter 44. If you begin about verse number 3. God says, I will pour my spirit out. He puts it this way. I will pour water upon him, that is the individual, that is thirsty. 
But that's not all. It's not only that God pours water on the individual, the Spirit of God on the individual, but the next phrase says, and floods on the dry ground. Any dry ground around your neck of the woods? Oh, yeah. Neighbors, friends, relatives that are lost, it's all dry ground. Any dry ground in your own heart? What will make a difference? Out of those paths of uh, the ruts, the way we always did it, and uh, we get into that rut so quickly, do we not? What's the way out of that? It's the Spirit of God, the watering, if you will, of your own heart. And when that occurs, others get in on it. It's the dry ground round about. Now, he isn't finished yet. For he goes on to say, I will pour out my spirit on your offspring. You know why that the Lord has called your attention to the level of maturity of the missionaries that are going out even though they are young? It's because you're seeing the result of somebody hungering and thirsting after God and God pouring the Spirit on that one and God then putting the water out there on the dry ground and he's using the younger generation. I say praise the name of our God. Listen, nothing ought to be more exciting than what God is doing in your very midst. If I was down here closer, I'd join this church, if you'd have me. I really would. I can anticipate God doing something here. Praise the name of the Lord. You ought to be shouting. You ought to be thanking God. And that's not all. And here's the message. Open your Bibles now, if you will, to Revelation, the second chapter. Revelation the second chapter. I want to speak to you tonight for a few minutes. You know how preachers pay attention to time, few minutes. Hopefully the Lord will give me very succinct message, a very on target message. In fact, I've given you the message already. All I'm going to do now is give you some warning. Okay? Take your head up and down. That's okay, preacher. Amen. The second chapter of the book of Revelation, I begin in verse number one. Under the angel of the pastor of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. Who is that? Talk to me. Christ. It is the Lord Jesus. Who? walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. The idea, the idea there is the perseverance and how that thou canst not bear them or endure them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and has borne, again it is persevered, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted or become weary. Nevertheless, I have against thee, because thou hast left, that is, forsaken, thy first love. They have forsaken the preeminence and the priority and the passion of their relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, your priority and my priority is Jesus Christ. That's not just priority number one. That is priority, period. Jesus Christ. Remember, therefore, here's the instruction, given the problem. 
Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick or lampstand out of his place, except thou repent. Let's pray. Father, I and we are bowing in your presence tonight. We are acknowledging that you have blessed us during these days. There's no doubt about it. And you further want to bless us in the days ahead. And not only that, Father, you want to use us. That's a marvel to us, but nevertheless, you want to use us. That's the reason why you saved us. Not that we would just simply be taken to heaven, but that you could use us as light and salt, as a testimony to our God. And Lord, that's exactly what we want to be. And so, Lord, our prayer tonight is, Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord, for thy servant and thy servants await to hear from thee. And God's people said, Amen. It was the work of the priest to go into the holy place and to trim the seven-branched lamp of gold. Here you see our high priest who walks in the middle of the seven golden candlesticks. His work is not part-time, it is full-time. He lights the lamps, he pours in the sacred oil, and he removes the impurities that would dim the light. You have been challenged during these days to begin to remove the impurities or put yourself rather in a position where God can remove the impurities in your life. Now make no mistake about it, the finest saint in here, the most godly person in here still has impurities in their heart and in their life. I've said to you before, the closer you get to Christ, the more impurities you begin to see in your heart and life. There are a lot of people that think that's negative. They think the whole message of repentance is negative, but you listen, friend, it is the most positive message that you can ever hear because when you hear that prophetic voice saying it's time to repent, you can be guaranteed that God is not finished with you yet. And that's one of the reasons why I'm encouraged about this church and the congregation and the people that have come as your missionaries or possible missionaries to go around the world. What is God saying? God is saying, make sure your heart is right. Make sure that your heart is aflame with the gospel because that makes it effectual here and everywhere else. Listen, friend, if this altar is lined with the saints of God crying out, Oh God, examine my heart. Oh God, forgive me here, forgive me there. Oh God, I pray for the missionaries, that, uh, that uh, uh, wound family there in Nepal. Oh God, make them a living flame to a dying world over there. Give them wisdom and your direction, Lord, the power, the anointing of the Holy Ghost to be upon their lives. I'm telling you tonight, friend, out of a heart that is inflamed with the love of God, that kind of praying will indeed make the word effectual in Nepal and China and everywhere else around the world including Boomer, West Virginia. Our Lord is a constant worker. 
Our Lord is fit to deal with the churches which are his golden lampstands. Why? Nobody knows so much about the lamps as the person whose constant work is to watch them and trim them. No one knows the church like the Lord Jesus does, for his is the daily care. He continually walks amongst us. He holds the preachers as stars in his right hand. His eyes are always on us, so he knows our deeds, he knows our sufferings, he knows our sins. His eyes are like a flame of fire. So he sees with penetration, with discernment, and with accuracy. He is not only the constant worker, he is the careful observer. As he is the most careful observer, so he is the most candid. He is the faithful as well as the true witness. He loves much, and therefore he never judges harshly. He loves much, and therefore he always judges jealously. He will neither speak smooth words or bitter words, but he will speak the truth in love. He is the tender observer. No one can be more tender. Those lamps, listen to me, are very precious to the Savior. You want to know why? It cost him his life, dear one, to light them. Think about it. That's exactly what it cost him. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Praise the name of the Lord. He has completed the redemption of his bride, but he continues her preservation. Our prayer must be, Lord Jesus, come into our midst and put our light in order. Oh, for the presence of the Lord to search us as well as to sanctify us. Now, in this text, written to that church of Ephesus and to us, I want you to notice three things. Number one, Christ perceives I know thy works, nevertheless I have against thee. Number two, Christ prescribes, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent. And Christ persuades, with a threatening first of all, I will remove thy candlestick out of his place. There's nothing worse than that. Listen, friends, I travel all over America and beyond. And there are a lot of churches that their candle has been put out. They still look okay, but they're only going through the motions. They're only going through the motions. That ought to cause you and me to fear. It ought to cause you and me to seek the Lord with all of our heart that that be not true. And I do not believe it is true here. And then with a promise he persuades, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now the history of this church, if you were to go back to Acts the 19th chapter, they had great revival. Book burnings. A lot of people getting saved. The power of God demonstrated. All of that occurred right here in Ephesus. Ephesus had some great preachers in the past. They had Apollos. They had the Apostle Paul. And this was the headquarters of John the Beloved before they sent him out to the Isle of Patmos at hard labor. They had some great preachers. I remember uh, a number of years ago, being in First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, when Dr. W.A. Criswell was pastor. Now that church was founded in 1886, and this was in the 1980s, middle to later 1980s at that time. And that church only had two pastors in its whole history. The first one was George W. Truett, the second was Dr. W.A. Criswell. Do you know what a testimony that is to a congregation? It's not just the preachers, it's a congregation. Be that kind of church. 
Be a loving church. Be a praying church. Amen. Well, Christ proceeds. If you look at this text, you see that Jesus sorrowfully perceives the faults. His love is not blind. Now, he'd already commended them. They're a hardworking bunch. They were patient and persevered in persecution. They were strong in discipline, in faith, and in faithfulness toward the heretics. Yet Jesus said, I have against thee because thou hast left thy first love. I want to ask you tonight, are you still in that first love? to your Savior? Think with me. How was it the day you got saved? Was it a joyous day? Are you still got that joy tonight? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. Do you still have that joy? Do you still have that desire for the word? I remember preaching a meeting out in Seattle, Washington a few years ago, and that congregation had known a measure of revival. Now here's what it looked like. You got there an hour ahead of time, and there was already a whole bunch of folks that were there, and guess where they were sitting? The earliest ones got the front row. The next group got the second row. Now when you preached, they were unsatisfied if you only preached for an hour. I mean, they would come up to you and say, Preacher, how come you didn't go on? And not only that, this is the picture that you got when you looked out on that congregation they had their Bibles open, and it, was, it just looked like a bunch of baby birds. You know how they look? Put it in there, Mom. They were hungry for the Word of God. And you know what happened when the last amen was said? They went to prayer. They went to prayer. They talked about how God had spoken to their hearts, how God had blessed them. And if God pricked at them and poked at them during the message, you know what they did? They got up and went out to prayer meeting and came back. And when they came back, there was a glow on their face because they had met God. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that's the way it's supposed to be. It's the way it's supposed to be. There's a hunger. There's a joy. And you know what else is true of those when you first get saved? You couldn't be shut up. I remember when Ginger and I got saved, it happened to be that her folks and my folks were there because we got saved on Palm Sunday in 1966. And they were up there. Well, when, <laughs> when we got home, if Ginger wasn't talking, I was talking, and back and forth. And our folks were just sitting there smiling. Because, you see, we had found the Savior, or the Savior had found us, and the fact was that our hearts were free, and when your hearts are free, you can't be shut up. If you want to see that in the Word of God, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And specifically, look at verses 17 and 18. Verse 17 says that where the Spirit is Lord, there is freedom. See, you can tell when Jesus Christ is the ruling one in your heart and life, or if it's self back on the throne, because of the freedom or lack thereof that you have. When you first got saved, the result was you had just surrendered your heart and life to Jesus Christ. He was Lord of your life, and the result of that was all of the stuff that comes out of him being Lord is evident. You know what? 
That's the way it's still supposed to be. And you're finding as you are being pricked and poked at during these days by the Holy Spirit, you're being brought under conviction for certain issues in your life, whether it be motives or whether it be actions or lack of actions, makes no difference. When you confess that matter and forsake that matter, the result is always the same. There is a freedom that begins to come back. Challenge to my heart, and I trust the challenge to your heart, is the Lord Jesus says in this text, the beginning is this, remember, remember. Every one of you in this room, if you've been born again, your mind ought to be going back to when you got saved. And you ought to be thinking about how wonderful it was when you got saved. And it doesn't make any difference, friend, whether you were older when you got saved or whether you're younger. The outcome's always the same. I mean, if you've given your heart and life to Jesus Christ and you know your sins have been washed away and they're buried in the depths of the sea, never to be remembered again, listen, friend, that is a happy time. It's a joyous time. It's a hungry time. It's a free time. Praise the name of the Lord. And that's exactly the way the Lord wants it every day of your life. Remember. Remember. Now hold your finger there in Revelation and go back with me, if you will, to Joshua, the 24th chapter. Pick up the reading. <clears throat> In verse number 14. This is Joshua's farewell address. Last message in the missions conference. Amen. <laughs> now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, underscore this, mark it, choose you this day whom ye will serve. I have people all over the place tell me this, but preacher, I've already chosen to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I have been saved. Question, what about today? What about today? You say, you can't be saved twice. I understand that. I'm talking about relationship. I'm talking about the maintenance of that relationship that was established when you got down on your knees and gave your heart and life to Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the fact that God comes into your life so that he might flow through your life in power and blessing everywhere you go. Choose you, circle it this day, today. Let me go on and illustrate. What about this day? What God am I following today? Am I following the God of vanity, that which is not going to count in eternity? If I, am I giving my life for something that doesn't amount to a hill of beans as far as eternity is concerned? Is that what I'm doing? Is that the God that I'm serving today? Or maybe it's the God of pride today. I know something. I know somebody. Well, after all, our church has got correct doctrine. Big deal, friend, if your church has got correct doctrine. If your heart's not right, it doesn't amount to a hill of beans again. You see, that doctrine, friend, as I said earlier in the week, has got to be a living doctrine. 
It's got to be living. Well, what else? What God am I serving today? Could it be the God of laziness? Hello? How many of us sleep in in the morning? You say, but preacher. I know. A lot of whining going on. A lot of complaining. The old timers used to say a hard bed is conducive to spirituality. Hello? Laziness. Or, what God am I serving this day? Maybe it's the God of materialism. Or maybe it's the God of covetousness. I want, I want. Or maybe it's the God of self. Now here's what happens. Any other God but the true and living God, it always results the same. That is stagnation. Stagnation. I've got the mind right, but the heart's not right, you see. Again, I've shared this with you earlier in the week, but it bears repeating. You get in a rut, it leads to your rot, eventually it leads to your ruin, A.W. Tozer. The result of that is stagnation. The mind is involved, but the heart's not there. There's no filling of the spirit. Self is in control. It's lifeless. There's no freedom. There's no power. Listen, friend, you must be up to date with God this day, or you've chosen another God. And I warn you, the word choose in the word of God expresses eternal consequences. We're talking about very serious issues. Do you see how important it is that you confess sin on a daily basis? Do you see how important it is that you're praying, God, show me my heart as you see my heart? Do you see how critical that is? Do you see how wonderful it is then to be able to confess that sin and forsake that sin? Because the result is always the same. There's a livingness that begins to come back into your heart as a Christian. And the wonderful thing is, it's not just this kind of livingness, thump, 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 but it's God's kind of livingness. And you know what? God's kind of livingness makes an impact wherever you go. And so the Lord says, remember, go back. And then he says, Repent, turn right around on this matter, and go in the right direction from it. Now, warning here. God always deals in specifics, never in generalities. If you have this voice saying, Larry, you put your name in there. You're a dirty, rotten sinner. Where does that come from? Does that come from God's spirit? No, that comes from Satan's spirit. Satan only deals in generalities. God deals in specifics. I shared with you, I think, that uh, I was in, when God had called me, or recalled me in a sense, Uh, to do what I'm doing today, and that's a long story, and I don't have time to share that with you tonight. But when he got a hold of my heart, and I knew the direction that I was supposed to go, an issue that God dealt with me about was in our congregation there in, in Texas, 
We were singing uh, one of my favorite hymns. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every month. It's day. And you know what I sense? God's Spirit pointed his long finger. You know how they used to accuse those old preachers of having one finger that was about a foot long? He pointed that long finger at me and he said, Larry, you are lying. Now that is the Spirit of God. And he deals with you and me on specific issues. It may not be lying. It may be, Larry, that motive stinks. It is a wrong motive. When God called me to do meetings for revival, he took me through that too. Larry, why are you doing what you're doing? Well, my first response is, but Lord, this is what you want me to do. And he comes back at me again. But why are you doing what? Why do you want revival, Larry? Is it so that people will look at you and think you're somebody great? Is it because that you want only independent Baptist churches to be blessed? And on and on it went. You see, you and I do things that may be correct, but we do it with a wrong attitude. How many times do you and I grumble? Oh, surely not. Or we complain. Oh, we moan. Do you know that all of those things grieve the Spirit of God? And when the Spirit of God is grieved, there are always two things that happen. Number one, you begin to develop spiritual cataracts. In other words, your spiritual sight becomes a little fuzzy. And number two, you always begin to develop a spiritual hardness or callousness. That is, your sensitivity to the Holy Spirit that once was alive is now becoming dead until you don't sense the Spirit's voice as you used to. The Lord says to you and to me, repent, remember it, and repent. The third thing that he says in this text is return and do the first works. And this is the toughest of all, to do the first works. For you see here, you must return to what you were doing at the beginning in your Christian life. But it cannot simply be mechanical. You see, it's got to be from the heart. Have you noticed, as I have, that the heart is the hardest thing to deal with? The heart is my big problem. How about you? Shake your head up and down because that's right. It is. Keeping your heart right is the biggest issue you have. Is it any wonder that God said, guard, garrison your heart? Why? Because out of it are the issues of life. Remember that first love. Remember how it was when you first got saved. Repent if it hasn't grown and gone on from that point. In fact, has diminished. Repent, he said, and do the first works. Return. Come back to that place. Sunday morning. Sunday night, prayer meeting. Yes, but, and that's the beginning. I mean, you've got to physically put yourself there. 
But then all the while you're praying, Oh God, restore the fire. Oh God, restore the love here that I once had. The joy that I had of being in the house of God, of being with the saints of God. You ever think about that? You ever think about what you're testifying about tonight? Getting to be with the saints of God all week long? What are you saying? You're saying, first of all, I'm a part of the family of God. You're saying, these are little foretastes of glory divine that's coming down the road. Hey, this ought to be wonderful times, glorious times that God has allowed us to be together. The Lord says, remember. He says, repent. And he says, return and if you don't he'll say I'll take the light out do you mean you lose your salvation preacher look up here and understand me very clearly no you do not but you lose your usefulness unto God, and then it is God's timing when he takes you on to glory. And be aware, there are no rewards for that kind of life. Is this a serious time? Yes. Are these week of meetings, has it been a serious time? I know that we've been challenged and stirred. I know that indeed the, the level is rising, the spiritual level in this congregation. Follow it on. Keep on going. Be encouraged by the fact that your God has said, come on, saints. It can get better and better. It can get gooder and gooder. Amen. It can get so good that indeed the saints will be so happy on the inside that the lost ones on the outside are going to begin to come to the door and say, let me in. Let me in. Or your neighbor's going to come and say, hey, tell me about this Jesus that you're serving, the one that is obvious that you're in love with. God's done it before, friend, and God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and don't you forget it. God has given you the green light. Yeah. He's saying go, saints, but I'll tell you how you go. You go on your knees. You go on your knees. Everything by prayer and supplication, saith the Lord. Everything. Everything. Praise the name of the Lord. That's what the Lord told me to tell you tonight. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't make the mistake of choosing another God. Choose him. Follow him. Give your all to him. Dale Moody was confronted with this challenge. That God is looking for a man whose heart is totally given to God. And you know what D.L. Moody said? I'll be that man. Do you know how many souls were born into the kingdom of God under the ministry of D.L. Moody? One million souls. One million souls. And you say, but 
We've got a lot of billy goat religion. But he was a super saint. Do you realize D.L. Moody had an eighth grade education? Yeah. You realize that's why God put in James chapter 5, Elijah prayed and he prayed again. But he said about Elijah that Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. He knew some individuals say, but Elijah, he was a super saint and I'm just a regular. Listen, friend, don't forget this. One with God is a majority. Don't ever forget it. You have no excuse for not going on with God. God's given you the green light. Go on with God. And just see what God will do. Out of your life? Yeah. Out of this congregation? Yes, yes, yes. Let's stand together for prayer. Oh, Father, tonight I bow in your presence and I rejoice, Lord, in what you've done during these days. And there's no credit to this preacher. Lord, it's been your good hand. It's been your spirit that has been at work in this place. Lord God, how we praise you tonight that you have stirred our hearts. You have challenged our hearts. You have caused us, Lord, to get on our knees. You have caused us, Lord, to remember where we were. You have caused us, Lord, in some cases to repent, to turn around. And there are folks tonight, Lord, that are beginning to return. They're beginning to understand the waywardness of their heart in the past. They're beginning to understand it is not only important to be here Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night and whenever else the missions uh, are going on or the meetings are going on. But Lord, with a right heart, with a heart that is in love with Jesus Christ, oh God, Everything else in this world is going to be done and gone. But the love of Christ remains. Oh, bless the truths to our hearts here tonight. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation, but I want us to sing this little song before we do that. I think you all know it. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Can you say that honestly from your heart tonight? Brethren, if you cannot, it can be. It can be. May God help it to be so in all of our lives. Let's sing, have thine own.